Good evening. Um, I'm Steve West from the Dairy Knowledge Exchange team, and welcome to this evening's we webinar entitled Indicators of a Healthy and Productive Life. I'm jo joined tonight by Professor Alex Back uh, from the Catalan uh, Institution for Research and Advanced Studies from Barcelona in Spain. So welcome, Alex. So first, I'd like to just go through the customary housekeeping slide. Um, this event is an hour and a half slot. Uh, we're due to finish at nine o'clock. I believe we've, we've got about an hour of content, roughly, and there'll be plenty of time for questions. Now, in terms of the questions, how a lot of people are familiar with this will have done this many times, but on the right-hand side, you'll see an orange arrow. If you click that arrow, you will see the box on the right that will come out, and there's a question box. All questions are anonymous, so there's no such thing as a daft question. I'll be asking plenty of those today anyway. Um, so please fire away with any questions that you've got. Um, we'll try to save question spots towards the end, just so that we can make sure that we, we don't disrupt the flow too much. Uh, but anything really pressing, I'll, I'll try to ask during the presentation if I can. So um, I'd just like to introduce our speaker properly um, because this is a, a pinnacle moment for us. Um, so um, Professor Alex Back has, um, is working at the Catalan Institution for Research and Advanced Studies at Barcelona. Uh, he conducts research uh, into the physiology and metabolism of ruminants uh, with a special emphasis on early development. He's received many awards in recognition of his research activities uh, and he's spoken at over 130 international congresses. In fact, I, I met him uh, back in 2018 when he came to Total Dairy. Uh, he's an author and co-author of over 150 peer-reviewed papers uh, and many more books and book chapters. So to set the context for why we've got Alex helping us uh, today and what we're going to be talking about, back in 2015, uh, AHDB started activity on our calf to calving campaign. Uh, and this was following Alana Bolton from the RVC's levy funded PhD, uh, which had started a few years prior. Now we discussed during this campaign, target setting, colostrum management, general management of calves, and of course costs. And of course we've seen those rise in the very recent years. Now, um, Alex's papers, amongst others, uh, were repeatedly cited during this campaign, along with many times um, in updates to AHDB resources. In 2018, Jim Reynolds came across from the University of Pomona from California. He cited Alex's work. And even back two months ago, when Dr. Ginny Sherwin from the University of Nottingham helped us with our room and development campaign, she cited Alex's work. So it was only a matter of time, really, before we brought Alex across to meet you all in person. And I know tonight isn't in person, isn't truly face to face. Uh, but Alex will be joining us for a week uh, in March, in the middle of March, uh, for a series of meetings across the, the, wing, the west of England. So I'll give you more, more details of those later on. Um, but at this stage, uh, I'd like to hand you across to Alex. Uh, this will be a slightly bumpy moment because we're just going across to a different, I'm doing two things at once. Yeah. There we go, and I'll hand over to Alex. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for the, for the introduction. And I really look forward to be with you in person and not through screen. Um, I gather that you can see my screen, right? Not quite, no? actually. Let me just... Let me just, this is a bumpy start. Bear with us one moment. There we go. Okay, right. now yeah. Right. There we now go. You can see it, right? We can indeed, yeah. And we're in full screen mode, so that's perfect. Over okay. to you, Alex. Uh, let me get this out, okay. So that's the title that's, uh, that Steve have already mentioned. So uh, I'm just gonna go the next slide. 
Um, and I will be talking about management and key performance indicators. And I will start with a little bit of philosophy, um, stating that managing uh, a dairy herd professionally requires taking decisions objectively. Okay, and and I like to emphasize the word objectively. Okay, because that requires data. And in many occasions, we do have data on the farm, but we really struggle to extract information from that data. So there is a big difference between data and information. And today, we have plenty of data. We have data about uh, health, about uh, rumination, about meal production, uh, but we should use that data to make decisions, all right? And therefore, we should also avoid using our experience or expertise or gut feeling to make decisions, which is not typically the case. Eh? I, I, in many instances, when I go to a farm, I see many decisions that have been taken just by gut feeling, just by, okay, I think this is the best. So we have to avoid the I think, and we have to replace that by we believe based on these data and evidence that that's the way to go. So that's what you see in the farms. Um, you can see things like uh, beautiful books like this, which is lots of data in there, but boy, a little information. It's, it's really tough to make a decision based on that. And even if you have computers and data on the computer, you end up with lots of reports and paperwork that, again, it's, it's difficult to handle. Um, why is that? Well, because if you are a, a reproductive expert or a nutritionist or a mastitis guy, um, you need to integrate data. And if you have a question on, okay, what's the lameness incidence? Oh, wait a second, I'm going to go for an Excel sheet and then I'm going to load information in there. Now, if you want to know something about nutrition, there is another Excel sheet where the information is. So all the information is sparse, okay? So it's, it's distributed in different sites. And it's a lot of effort to integrate it. And producers and consultants, they do that, but because it's so difficult to do, they only look at this data in summaries of maybe monthly reports, at best, maybe weekly reports. So at the end of the day, what we are end up doing is that we're managing herds by looking through a rear mirror, okay? So yes, we know that we passed the curve, but we are unable to see that in front of us there is another curve. Okay, so we, we really need to change our minds and start using data to look ahead and stop looking back. Works. So uh, the other aspect that we'll be mentioning in this webinar is longevity and health. Okay, so one thing will be data and the other one will be health and, and, and longevity. And I would like to start with a comment on longevity. Uh, there is a good aspect of longevity and there is a bad aspect. The good one is that yes, um, longevity is achieved properly, it means that the cows are healthy and it's good for the public opinion and it's very good for the environment and make a very good use of natural resources and also economic resources. The bad side is that if it is not achieved properly, it's really detrimental for all the above, eh? for, for the environment, for the health of the cows and, and for the economics. And I'll give you an example. So um, there are two ways of getting a better longevity. One is doing a very good job with heifer breeding, calf breeding, cow care, transition, all this. So we end up with cows that are robust. They never get sick or very seldom. They don't have mastitis or anything. So they just stay with us for a long time. The other way of getting uh, an extended longevity or an extended life of cows is by giving them a second chance. Okay, and there is nothing wrong with a second chance, but we really have to think about it. Okay, by a second chance, I mean, okay, this cow, oh boy, she had amastitis and ametritis, and now she's not getting pregnant. Uh, but you know what? Because I have to increase my longevity, uh, I'm just gonna inseminate her another time, or maybe a third time, or maybe a fourth time. Or you have another cow that, oh, she's not producing a lot of milk, but you know what, I need to increase longevity, so I'm just going to stay with this cow because longevity is very important. Um, we have to be careful with that, uh, because if as a result of seeking longevity, our lactation length increases, we might not get a nice outcome. People will say, well, no problem, because if you increase longevity by extending the lactation, that means instead of having a lactation length of maybe 300 days, 
you go to a lactation length of 400 days, you're actually diluting the reading cost of the animals. So if you have three lactations, so that would be one lactation, that would be one dry period, second lactation, one dry period, third lactation, so three lactations, but these lactations are short uh, because my cows are reproductively efficiently and everything clicks. It turns out that 20% of the life of that cow was unproductive, okay? And of course, I can add this two and two, that would be 4% additional, right? But if my lactation length is greater, now my productive life, uh, my unproductive life, sorry, so the amount of time that uh, I invest in, in, in building this machine that produces milk, it's lower. So some people say, well, that's more efficient, right? Because uh, out of the years that you stay with this cow, she's been producing money for a greater proportion of time. That all sounds very good, but be careful with that rationale. And now I'm gonna uh, degrade this rationale. So on the left, we have uh, a short lactation, okay? So where I'm, where I'm heading is, okay, the cows are properly handled, there is no problems. So, and on the right, I have these cows and I'm giving them a second chance. And as a result, my lactation length increases. For these cows here, uh, feed cost only. So to feed these cows that in the reading process and, and the first, the dry, the second, the dry, and the third lactation, I'm gonna invest about 7,193 euros or pound, it doesn't really matter. Here, I'm gonna invest more money, right? Because uh, they stay with me for a longer time. Now, if I look at how much milk I'm getting out of these guys, uh, in this case, I'm getting 11,400 euros or pounds in milk. And in this case, with longer lactations, I'm getting more milk. So I'm getting 13,376. So if I do the math, it turns out that here I make 4,500 in profit, and here I make 4,200. So one would be tempted to say, that a extended lactations and increased longevity just for the sake for for the sake of it, it's more profitable, right? Because I make more money at the end of the process. There is a catch with this rationale, and is that yes, you make more profit, but in how much time? Uh, if you have short lactations, you have uh, one thousand seven hundred sixty days of productive life. In these ones, with 400 lactation, uh, days of lactation, you have 2,000 productive days. So when you normalize the profit on a daily basis, short lactations will render 2.36 euros uh, cents per day. However, the cows that have greater longevity because they have extended lactations, they will only give you 2.21 euros per day or pounds. Right? It's the same thing. So um, this really needs to be taken into account. Eh? So I'm not advocating for a short life of the cow. I'm advocating for cows that stay with us for a long time, but that does not compromise lactation length. If we achieve longevity by increasing lactation length because we give a cow a second chance, we are very likely to compromise the profit of the herds. Okay, so then how can we ensure that everything clicks and we can maximize longevity uh, by reading and taking care of our cows? So we minimize disease and, and, and maximize production. Well, we have some KPIs and that's what I will cover in, in the next few slides. And there are two types of KPIs, the ones that I like and the ones that I don't, okay? <laughs> to make it short. And the ones that I don't really like are very common ones, okay? And, and are these ones here. The reason why I don't really like them is because they don't give me a straight answer. So by monitoring days open, I don't know where my problem is, okay? If my days open are very high, is it because my cows do not conceive or because I don't see heat or because they, the cows, they just don't get in heat? Um, Many things can affect that. The same thing for days in milk or culling rate. Um, rolling her average, well, if this goes up or down, how do I fix it? I, I, I don't have an answer or a solution for an apparent problem that this KPI might give me. Calving interval is something that I will 
comments in, in, in a few slides later. Uh, this will never be used, okay? I'm just advancing this, uh, and I will beg you to not to use cabin interval anymore when you go to a farm. We should You should stop asking this question, and I'll explain why this is important that we stop. Um, average lactation number, yeah, that would be an indication of longevity. But if my average lactation number increases or decreases, why? Why do I fix or why did I achieve that number? Um, you don't really know. Is it because of reproduction, because of nutrition, because of health? We, we, you never know. However, the KPIs on the right, they pinpoint a specific problem or solution. So if my somatic cell counts go up, I really know that I have to look at the milking machine or milking routine or the bedding of my cows or maybe some vaccination programs even. Conception rate is the same. Then I need to look at my insemination protocols, my nutrition, but it's a targeted problem, right? The one that doesn't have a, a, an easy solution, but it's pivotal for the herd, is income over feed cost. And I will be talking about this quite a bit uh, later on. Um, yes, if income over feed cost goes up or down, it's multifactorial. It could be because my daisy meal change or because my nutrition changes, but it's so important that we still really need to look at it. I much prefer to look at income or feed cost than looking at meal production. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. So what typically happens when we go to a farm is that we ask these questions. The first question that we ask, or maybe the second one is, how much milk do your cows produce? And to me, that is an okay question, but I would not, it would not be the first one at all. Okay, it would be probably my, my 10th or my 12th question. Daisy milk, boy, um, that is not very important either. It is important, but it's not going to give me information that I can use to make a suggestion or a change in the farm. Eh? So this is very important. Daisy milk is, is relevant, but it's not useful to make decisions. Okay, It's relevant to tell you, hey, these things are okay or not okay, but how to fix them is not going to help you. Uh, butter fats, uh, calving interval, uh, we'll talk about this, uh, conception rate, pregnancy rate, this, this I like, they are, they, are, they are interesting. This open, it's a very biased uh, measure because it only takes into account cows that are pregnant. You could be in a situation where you have 100 cows, you only have one cow that became pregnant at 80 days in milk. The other cows, they are not pregnant. Your days open is 80. Okay, and you probably have the other cows that are a thousand days in milk, and still your days open are 80, and you have a huge tremendous reproductive problem, and days open doesn't tell you. Okay, so you really have to be careful with that. But what I seldom see in a farm when people go there is asking these two key questions What is the feed efficiency? Because that is what's the conversion rate? So you're investing in these animals, you're putting feed in your furnace. So how much heat, how much money do you get out of that furnace uh, by putting uh, feet or investing pounds in that? And the other one that's very, really important is your gross margin, okay? What is your income or feed cost? And that's very relevant because if we only ask this meal production and we forget about feed efficiency and feed intake, we have a very biased picture of the reality. And I'm giving you here a couple of examples. Uh, this is data from a software that collects and integrates data. It's called AlgoMilk. And on the left, you see income and feed cost of different farms. Okay, these are every number is a, is a different farm. And you can see that these farms here, the one on the right has a greater income and feed cost than the one on the left. But if you look on the graph on the right, the very same mm, farm, the one that has greater milk production, about almost two liters more has actually a lower income or feed cost. Okay? So I'm, I'm comparing the, the bar on the left with the bar on the left here. And another example, okay, these guys here, this, this farm here produces 37 liters, this one produces 34. The one that produces 34 is actually making seven euros of uh, IOFC or mar uh, gross margin. And the one that's producing 36 or 37 liters is only producing six something, okay? So more milk doesn't mean more money. Uh, and that's very important. 
Okay, so we, we as consultants, we really need to focus on income of feed costs because that's what makes herd sustainable. Okay, there are two legs in the sustainability process. One is that it's good for the environment or at least neutral. And the other one is that it's good for the pocket of the producer because if there is no money at the end of the day, and if you're very gentle with the environment, that's not going to be sustainable. Right? These producers will no longer be producing if they don't make money. So if we're going to use data to make decisions and use KPIs to, to move forward uh, in a herd, we really need to understand a few concepts about data. And there are several concepts I'm just going to touch in, in, in two of them. Uh, there, there is five things, but the, the ones I will mention are the two most important ones. One is the distribution, okay? So uh, the distribution means what's the shape of the data that we have? And typically, most of the data that we have in a herd will follow what we call a normal distribution. A normal means that it follows like a bell shape, okay? So you have a whole bunch of data that it's here in the middle, and then you have some data on the left and some data on the right. But the peculiarity of the normal distributed data is that the median, okay, which is the metric that splits the data in half, so 50% of the cows in this case are below 35 liters or 35.5, and 50% of the cows are above 35.5, um, coincides with the average. Okay, so these two numbers are, are really, really similar. Okay, and that's that's the beauty of uh, normally distributed data. There is another type of data or distribution that is also quite common in herds, and it refers to data that it, that we typically count. So that would apply to lactation number, so that would be number of lactations, uh, number of inseminations, days open, days in milk, all these things that you count, they are typically not normally distributed. So they are either skewed to the right or skewed to the left. In this case, what I'm showing you here, the data we say that is skewed to the left, okay? And you see that the median, the point that splits the data in two, is 155, but the average is 210. What is the problem when we try to use data that is not normally distributed to make a management decision? So if we look at this number, that is 210, I will be inclined to say, oh, I have a reproductive problem. I'm going to change the protocols or I'm going to change whatever, right? And this change, it's going to affect all the cows. But in reality, if you were looking at the median instead of the average, you probably would not make that change because a median of 155 days in milk is not too bad. Okay, it's actually quite good. But the reason why you have an average of 210 is because you have a couple of cows here. In fact, it's one cow that has 800 days, uh, 800 days in milk. And then you have a couple of cows with 500 and 600. Now you're gonna make a management decision that's gonna affect, I don't know, 120 cows or whatever, just because you have three cows that are to the sky, okay? So you really need to avoid that. So um, it's very important that you know how data are distributed. And if they are not normally distributed, you should look at the median. Do not look at the average. What is the problem that most softwares, uh, DLaval, uh, the GIA, the Replan, and all these things, even the Recom, will give you means. They will not give you medians. So what you have to do is export the data, put it in Excel, and then calculate the median. For data that are normally distributed, is no problem. You can use averages and it's fine. Another important aspect uh, for making decisions based on data, okay? Uh, and that's lag. And lag is the time elapsed between a change occurs on whatever you're measuring, and that change is actually reflected in the average or the number that you're looking at. And the best example is what I was saying uh, before about calving interval. And what I was recommending or begging not to use calving interval anymore is because of that. If I give you these two figures, so I go to a farm and I say, hey, uh, in, two in, in 22, my calving interval was 380 days, okay? Now in 2023, 20, uh, my calving interval is 420. Your first reaction when you see these numbers is, oof, something is not good. Right, uh, my cutting interval is, is increasing. Two problems with cutting interval. First one, 
calving interval is that this the days between a cow calf and she calves again so if you have a calling rate in your herd of i don't know 30 percent or 20 percent whatever it is 20 percent of these cows are not in your metric so your data are biased that's the first thing um so imagine that you call all the cows uh, or you have a herd of 100 cows you kill 99 and you have one cow with a calving interval of 280 your calving interval will be 280 everything will be perfect okay so it's it's dangerous but what i consider that in addition that is dangerous that the, the biggest problem i have with calving interval is that is not informative at all to make a decision because the reason why I have a calving interval today of 420 is because something happened during 22 that made my cows not conceiving well. Now, today I'm in 2023. There is nothing I can do about what happened in 2022. So asking the effort of the producer to collect the data so I can look at calving interval is a waste of time because I can do nothing with that data, okay? All right, another concept about data is that it needs to be reliable. Uh, and that's very, very important. Data has this sense of security, of, uh, of feasibility, of that, that it makes us feel really secure of what we're doing because, hey, the data is there. And when the data are not accurate, then that becomes really dangerous because we see 6.53 and hey, we believe that this is really accurate and very important but it might be 10 or it might be 20 or it might be zero okay so that's that's a problem and a good example for that is uh, when we use the tape to estimate the body weight of calves or heifers uh, what i'm showing you here is the body weight estimated with an electronic scale that would be the gold standard that would be the, the measure that i trust and this would be the body weight estimated with a tape and hey if i were to draw uh, to draw a line it would be a very very nice fit so you could conclude from this uh graph that hey i can use a tape to accurately estimate body weight of heifers however there is a catch uh, every time that you do these things if the distance between uh, the minimum number in the x-axis and the maximum number is really big is the best method to make this line look good but when i'm using a tape my question is not knowing if this animal here is smaller or weighs less than this animal here what i'm using a tape here is because i want to know how much this animal weighs or i want to know how much this animal weighs so i need to look at this data in a different way and that's what i'm doing here this is the body weight with the scale and this is the body weight with the tape so now if i look at animal that in reality is i don't know 300 kilos okay so i'm here if i use a tape on this on this animal i'm gonna get a number here that will be 300 minus 20 so that's 280 or 300 plus 40 340 so if you're okay with that number so the tape will say hey this is 280 or this is 340 that's 60 kilo difference um you can use a tape but if you're trying to make a decision on inseminate an animal and your target is oh i want to inseminate my heifers when they are 400 kilos and you use a tape at 400 kilos well the tape will say this animal that is ready to be inseminated because this animal is 400 oh well it's 380 or hey it's past due, it's 450. So you really have to, to be careful with that, okay? All right, the, the last concept about data, um, it's a little bit the same thing that I did before with um, basic milk and, and culling or mortality rate and things like that. Eh? If you were gonna use KPIs for transition cows, because you are focusing on increasing longevity and you want to minimize incidents of disease and problems post calving you have two options well in fact you can use everything that's here on the screen eh? but um to me they are very different you have some indicators on the left and some indicators on the right i would be inclined to say that the ones on the right are the ones that most people ask 
in a farm. So when you are exploring problems post calving, I'm pretty sure that you're gonna ask, okay, how many milk fevers did you have or hypocalcemias? How many retained placentas? How many ketosis? How many mastitis? So you're gonna be counting diseases. How many cows left the herd? So you're gonna be looking at that. What was the treatment cost? What was the number of treatments? And really, yeah, that's okay information, but all you're doing is taking a picture. By counting ketosis, you're not gonna solve the problem. You're just gonna make it evident that there is a problem, okay? But the, the producer probably knows that without having to count them, okay? However, the, the guys on the left are the most important ones. The problem today is that we go to a farm and we ask these things. And these are very good to assess in the past, just to take a picture of the, of the herd. The ones on the left are very good for making decisions. But if I go to a farm and I ask the producer, oh, how many retained placentas did you get? Five. Oh, that's, that's very bad. Oh, that's very good. Uh, mastitis, how many? 20. Oh, that's very bad. Oh, that's very good. We give the sensation or the, or, or the impression that that's very important. So the producer will make an effort to collect that data. And in reality, if you ask these questions, this is what's going to be taking care of that. If you make sure that the cows eat properly before calving and after calving, that the energy levels of the diet are correct, that the protein levels are correct, that the comfort level of the cows is adequate, that the pen dynamics, so how often you change the cows and what's the stocking density and all this is, is, is good, soon enough, you're going to stop counting things because they will not be there. So that's the important thing. That's where we can take action to minimize that. So that's what we should be asking, and that's what we should be monitoring, okay? Of course, it's much easier to count ketosis than to measure stocking density on a daily basis in the pens or dry matter intake, but that's the important thing. So we really need to ask that, get that data and use it to then get rid of this counting thing. Okay, so like I said before, um, we are all making milk because yes, humans like to drink milk and the guys that make that milk, they need to make a living out of it. So economics is important. And this is the distribution of, or the contribution of the different um, activities in a herd to produce a liter of milk. And the single most important one is feed cost. Then we have uh, miscellaneous. Uh, here I have health issues. Okay, so that would be semen, that would be antibiotics, this would be vaccinations. Very small uh, uh, proportion of the cost of producing a liter of milk. Okay. Um, what, what this means is that a small decreases or improvements in feed cost will have tremendous repercussions on profits. If you want to have the same effect on profit by changing the cost of vaccination or the cost of insemination, you really have to double or triple the cost or, or divide it by three or by two to make a small impact, okay? So it's, um, it's very difficult to make improvements in profit by focusing on here. Focusing here is a bit easier. So that's why the rest of the top, the, the talk is gonna be more focused on this area. So things that we can do and, and interesting KPIs, very, very simple, huh? but it always bugs me when I go to a farm and the producer says, oh, could you do a ration for me? I say, yeah, sure. Um, what do you have? Oh, I already bought this. Oh no, don't buy anything before asking, okay? So the nutritionists, they go to a farm and they just look at what's, on the menu uh, and, and they should be part of what's on the menu. So they should be a very important component making the decision whether to buy or not. Should I buy corn or not? Should I buy alfalfa or not? Um, and the way to make that decision is by looking at the ingredients on a nutrient cost basis. So you basically need to put the ingredient cost and then divide it by the amount of the target nutrient that you're interested on. Uh, this could be protein, this could be energy, fiber, whatever you need in your ration. So I'll give you an example. Uh, if I go to a producer and I say, hey, I have alfalfa hay, and I have an alfalfa that's 16% crude protein or an alfalfa that's 20% crude protein, the producer will be really happy or more inclined, not happy, but more inclined to pay more for the alfalfa that has more protein. Okay, because we believe that protein in alfalfa is very good, then it's worth to, to pay for. 
So if nowadays alfalfa is 300 euros or pounds, doesn't matter, and it has 20% protein, every ton of protein from alfalfa costs 1,500 euros. Um, if I look at soybean meal, soybean meal is 600 euros a ton. Okay, it was 500 a couple of weeks ago, but now all of a sudden it went up 100 euros. Very expensive, double the price of alfalfa. 47% protein. It turns out that every ton of protein that I bring into my farm from soybean costs me 1,200 euros. So it's much cheaper than alfalfa. So if what I need in my diet is protein, is a bad decision to buy alfalfa of high protein content because I have other stuff that is cheaper providing alfalfa uh, protein. If my if the most expensive nutrient in my diet was fiber, then probably this calculation would be different and alfalfa would be much more interesting than soybean meal, right? But if uh, the rationale is protein, then soybean meal is better. So the message is if the producers are more inclined to buy or pay more for alfalfa with higher protein, be careful because there are alternatives that are cheaper or less expensive. Just a brief example of what the consequences of this. Eh? This is a diet that has, um, what is it? Alfalfa, it's here. So we have alfalfa, 18% group protein, okay? Or 19%, it has one kilo, okay? This diet costs, six euros 47 per cow and day now the producer uh goes and says hey i bought this alfalfa 22 percent. it was a very good price so now i have to reformulate the diet uh, i put 126 of this alfalfa because it has less fiber i need to put well, whatever i need to balance the diet it, it has the same energy the same protein the same fiber everything now the diet is six euros and 50 cents. So it went up three cents just because the producer bought an alfalfa of 22% group protein and before he had uh, alfalfa of 19% group protein. Okay, that was a bad decision. So that's why it's important that we participate in what is bought uh, in the farm. Okay, another uh, example when you do diets is in the same manner that we have KPIs for disease and ketosis and all that, nutritionists, they also have KPIs for the rations. And they consider that a ration is good if it has 37% bypass protein. But if it has 36, it's not good, okay? Well, uh, the difference in price. This diet here with a 36.7 cost 5.28. This ration here with a 37.5, so just one point more of bypass protein, it costs 5.33. So it's five cents more per cow and day. If I'm milking 500 cows, providing this extra 1% of bypass protein costs me 750 euros a month. Now, I'm okay with that, provided that bypass protein can be measured accurately. If bypass protein is measured using a, a body tape measure, the same example I gave you with heifers, I'm not happy at all with this restriction, okay? And in reality, it's impossible to really determine bypass protein of a product or a diet, okay? I know that the computer will give you a bypass value with six decimal places, very, very accurate, nothing to do with reality, okay? Um, I did a study where we compared 20 different uh, soybean meals and and bone meals, and we look at bypass protein values of these uh, ingredients. You can use six different models to estimate bypass protein. And the ranking of these ingredients in terms of bypass protein was totally different depending on the model and how bypass protein was calculated. And at the end of the day, I'm convinced that any of those models was actually right. So if I actually was putting that bypass protein in, in the cow, the real value would be different than the other 20 that I had. So what I'm saying here is that think twice before you put a constraint in a diet, if that constraint costs you money, okay? By a rule of thumb, I only put constraints that cost money in a diet if I can measure what I'm putting in there. Can I measure bypass protein? No. If you use stable values, don't put a constraint. Can you measure NDF, fiber content? Yes. Then put a constraint. Can you measure protein? Yes. Put a constraint. Can you measure effective fiber? You cannot. 
then don't put a constraint, okay? The other KPI, very, this is paramount, this is very important, and um, it's not easy. What I'm gonna say here is not easy, and nobody does, okay? So the, the reason is because it's not easy. But you go to a farm, and the nutritionist makes a ration. And if the cows are producing 35 kilos of milk, the nutritionist goes and makes a ration for maybe 37 or 36. But the key question is why 37 or why 36? How is the nutritionist determining at what level do we need to formulate the ration for? And when you ask that question, the answer is silence, okay? There is no method. So here is the most important factor affecting profitability in the herds is decided by gut feeling. It's decided by, okay, I think these cows will do better if I make a ration for 38 or for 36. So we really need to systemize how we do rations. And a good rule of thumb, uh, it's not perfect, eh? but it, it's, it's a start, is I like to do a ration that covers the needs of 70% of my cows. So in this case, um, this herd here, that's a distribution of milk production, my average is 37.5. 70% of the cows are below 39.5 liters of milk. So that's what I'm going to do the ration for. I'm going to make a ration for 39. All these cows here will be satisfied in terms of nutrients. I will have about 30% of the cows that will have uh, a need for extra nutrients that hopefully they will find in their bodies. Okay, They will mobilize body condition. A farm with 38.4 average milk production, you see that the distribution is a bit different than the other one. In this case, 70% of the cows are below 41.7. So it's about three, liter, three liters more. Here the difference was two liters. Here is three liters. So it depends on the herd. You're going to choose a different lead factor or different between average and actual formulation of the diet. That's very important eh? because making a ration for 42 liters of milk, like this one, is way more expensive than making a ration for 39. And if you're feeding a diet for 42 kilos in this herd, what's going to happen is that they're not going to produce more milk, so they're going to get fatter and you're going to lose money. And maybe in the next lactation, you're going to have a lot of ketosis and reproductive problems and poor longevity and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it, it's, it's very, very important to determine at what level of nutrition we need to, to nourish our cows. All right, so that's uh, the same example, and I think I will skip this because it will be, this is basically the same I was saying. Eh? If um, I have this herd that produces 38 liters and I could make a ration for 35, for 42 or for 45. And this is actually what happens. Eh? If I make it for 45, I make more milk. My average is 39. If I make it for 42, I make 38.6, a little bit less. And if I make it for 35, I make 37, a bit less. What happens is, if I feed this diet the for 35, I have a, a whole bunch of cows that are in negative energy balance. So they're going to lose body weight and probably have reproductive problems or e even disease or immune problems, immunity problems. If I do it for 42 kilos, then it's okay. But I have a whole bunch of cows that are on positive energy balance. So maybe now I'm on the other side and getting cows that are getting too fat. And if I feed for 45, it's even worse. Only a few cows are underfed and a whole bunch of them, almost all of them, are overfed. In terms of margin, Gross margin, income of feed cost. If I feed for 35, I make 1,500 euros or 1,140 with 228 cows. And this was the example that I was using. If I make a ration for 45, I make a little bit more, 1,558. But if I make one for 42, which is in between the other two diets, it's optimal. I make more money with a little bit less milk, okay? So if you look at the income of feed cost, uh, the ideal one or the maximum one is 6.89. Now that I've decided to do the diet, then I have to mix it. 
And that's another opportunity and, and a very important area of research. Uh, not much done in there. We're gonna we're gonna present this data in, in June in, in the American Data Science Association Congress in Ottawa this year. And basically what you're seeing here is deviations in the mixing of ingredients in the TMR wagon. Uh, this would be deviations of the total diet, and this is the weekly standard deviation of what's expected. So what you see here is that uh, in, a, in a week, there was about 3% deviation on the total diet. And what that means is that the greater the deviation, and deviation means actual versus expected. Eh? So I was expecting, I don't know, mixing 4,000 kilos, uh, and I was mixing 3,800 3, or 4,100, okay? The greater the deviation, the lower the meal production, okay? And it's about two liters. Eh? Here I have like 37, and if I go down the line, I'm gonna go down to 35. This is the total diet. You see the same thing with grain silages, that would be corn silage or sorghum silage or wheat silage. Deviations in kilos below or above what's expected, it's gonna result in an imbalanced nutrient supply, and that has a problem or a, a negative consequence on, on meal production. The same thing with protein sources. If you overfeed them or underfeed them, you're going to compromise milk production and the same thing with deviations. So that's also something very important to monitor is how well the guys are mixing the diets because one thing is the diet on paper and the other thing is the diet uh, that is mixed. Another very important concept and a big opportunity in the research. This is very, very important. Cows should be fed to meet their nutrient requirements. Eh? Uh, and when you do that, you can see here that you actually maximize meal production, okay? So if I have a situation where my cows need 25.5 megacals of energy per day, okay? And I know they eat 10 kilos, I have to supply 2.55 megacals of energy per kilo to provide 25.5, right? 10 times 255 is gonna be that. But if after two weeks of feeding this diet, my cows, they still need 25.5 megacals, but now they eat 10.5 kilos, I need to change my diet. Now every kilo of diet needs to provide less energy, 2.43. So 2.43 times 10 and a half is gonna give me that energy content. If I don't do that, if I don't change my diet, my cows will get extra energy because if they consume this diet here, they will get more energy, they will get fat, it's gonna be more expensive. How much expensive? Well, the diet on the left cost me 203 euros a ton because the animals consume 10 kilos. The cost per day is 2 euros 0 0.03. The diet on the right, because now I have more space because my cows eat more, I can put more forage. I can put more straw, more hay, more whatever, okay? So my cost now is 190. And despite the fact that the cows eat half a kilo more, the daily cost to feed these cows is three cents cheaper than in this scenario. So by reformulating the diet when the intake changes, I'm not only achieving avoiding cows becoming overfed or fat, I'm also reducing the cost three cents. No, you're not reducing the cost three cents. You're reducing the cost 13 cents. Why 13 cents? Because if you don't change the diet, you would have a situation where the cows are eating 10 and a half or something that costs 200. And you will be paying 2 euros 13. If you change the diet, you're gonna be paying 2 euros. Because that's a lot of money, okay? And on top of that, the cows will be healthier. Of course, you can do that um, in a small herd if you're milking 100 cows, 120. But in big herds, if you're mixing more than one TMR, then you have the opportunity of increasing profits and also improving the health of the cows by making groups. Because every TMR that you make could actually be prepared for a ration that's a bit different with the same effort, okay? So that's a free right. It is, it's inexpensive, it's actually free to make a ration that's different. By doing that, you can actually achieve something very important in terms of health and longevity. Now I'll give you an example that it's a little bit confusing, but it's uh, once you think about it, it's not that complicated. I have a TMR, okay, a single diet. 
uh, that has an energy content of 1.58 megacals per kilo. Okay, that's net energy. I'm feeding this diet to a cow here, or a bunch of cows, that produce 30 kilos, uh, sorry, um, 55 kilos of milk. They eat 30 kilos of peat, and they actually need 47.4 megacals. So this diet that has 1.58 meets the requirements. Here, everything is good. However, if I feed the same diet to these cows here, and these cows here are actually producing 28 liters of milk, they're at the end of the lactation, they only eat 22 kilos. And that's the catch that nutritionists will say, oh, you don't need to make a, new, a, new, a different ration because these cows that produce less milk actually eat less and they just balance their, their, their needs. Well, here is the concept. This diet, that has 158 megacals per kilo, when it's consumed by this cow here, in reality, now this diet has 169 megacals of energy. It's the same diet, but it has a different energy value. Very confusing, right? Um, it's net energy. Net energy means is the energy that the animal is able to extract. It's the amount of energy that the animal will use to get fat, or produce milk. Um, it's not the energy in the diet. Okay, the energy in the diet is the same, but the amount of the energy that will be retained in the animal is different. You can think of it as a furnace. And if you put a, a lock of wood in a furnace for one hour, which would be the case here, you will extract X amount of heat. Now you put the same lock of wood in this furnace here, but instead of keeping it in the furnace for a, an hour, you keep it for two hours, you're gonna get more heat out of that lock of wood, right? So that's exactly what happens. The cows here that produce lots of milk and need a lot of feed, passage rate is very high, so they're not able to extract all the energy in the diet. The cows on the right, they eat very little, they are very efficient getting energy out of the diet. They will become fat, they will have reproductive problems, ketosis, etc. And on top of that, it's gonna be expensive. Okay, so in this case, you should really make two different diets and two groups of cows. And in fact, the ideal situation would be to make one ration for every single cow. In the same example that I gave you before with the 228 cows that was making three different rations for 35, 42, and 45 liters of milk. Remember that the income of feed cost that I showed you was like 6.9 at the best case. If you make a ration for every cow, that would be the income. 7.81. Of course, this isn't reliable, right? It's, it's unrealistic. You cannot do one diet for every cow. But if you do groups, you get a bit closer. And in fact, this is what it would happen if in that herd of 228 cows, you do three groups. You do a group of uh, low, medium, and high production. And then the average production of the herd will be 39.3. And the income of feed cost of the herd will be 713. Remember that before, with a single diet, the best case that we could do was 6.9. So it's not the 7.8 theoretical maximum that we can get, but hey, it's 20 or almost um, yeah, 20 cents more uh, if we do groups than if we don't. Okay, So really, don't be afraid of making groups. The, the biggest fear of making groups is that cows will lose milk when you change them from one group to the other. And I agree with that. But you have to set that fear aside because the important thing is income or feed cost is not milk production. This is a paper that we just published. Uh, what you see here is times relative to a pen change of cows. Okay, so this is a cow that is moved from a high to a medium group. And she's moved right here. In red, we have milk production before the pen movement. Okay, and in gray, we actually use this data to forecast what, we sh what she would do if she had not been moved, so if she was still on the same diet. And of course, you see a decrease in milk production, okay? If we had not changed this cow from one pen to the other, she would be producing 43 liters. Now she's producing 42. So we lost one liter or something. Income of feed cost is the line in blue. Before the pen movement, she was producing about 6.0, no, 7.8, yeah, 7.8 income of feed cost. I'm looking here. If we didn't change her because she was getting a more expensive diet and producing more milk, that's the green light. She would be producing this amount of 
euros or pounds, about seven euros here. Now, because she's getting a cheaper ration, even if she loses milk, here she makes the same amount of money, but here she starts actually to make more money, okay? So I don't really care if I lose milk, I'm making more money. This is another example. This is data from a whole bunch of cows. Every, every graph of this is like 700 cows or 800 cows. Same example. Uh, but in this case, it didn't work. In this case, there is a huge drop in milk and a huge drop in income or feed cost. I'm losing milk and I'm losing money. The reason is the differential in energy between the two diets was too big given the difference in price. And you really have to be careful. You have to look at what's the cost of energy. The cost of any of every unit of energy in this diet after the movement was more expensive than the cost of every unit of energy in this diet. And that's what make the system fail. Okay, so that's something that you really need to focus on. Here's another example where things are doing well. Cows are losing very little milk and making a lot of money. Okay? So the, the message is making groups is not guarantee that you're going to make more money, but if you do it right, I'm sure you will. This is real data, uh, again, from this software that tracks uh, almost everything on a cow on a daily basis. And you can see that this cow, she had an insemination and then she was pregnant. In yellow, you see that she's in the high group and then she's moved to the medium group and there is little loss in milk production. And then she's moved to uh, a low group and also milk production goes down a little bit, but not much. What happens to income of feed costs? You can click here on IFC and you would see it. And look at this beautiful thing. Um, this cow was producing eight euros of income, and after the pen movement, now she produces nine. So with a little bit less milk, she actually produces more money. And the same thing here. Okay, she was making six euros, and now she's making a little bit more than six. Yeah? And, and, and the curve would have been like that. Eh? So if, if you were to extend this, it would be like that. Okay, and just to come to the end a little bit it's just i will i will finish with the beginning which is replacements right yeah. and calf and, and heifers will be a topic that will be extensively covered when i come to the uk in in a few weeks so i'm just gonna throw here a couple of slides to send some messages um the first one is yes uh, heifers determine the quantity of the cows that we have in a herd but also the quality okay and that goes along with longevity and, and environment and all that it's responsible for a lot of resources, economics, and also environmental impact, right? Because uh, heifer breeding contributes to about 20, 25% of the carbon footprint in a dairy farm. So if we reduce the amount of heifers that we have, we actually do a very good job with the uh, environment. So the key aspects will be to maximize success, to improve uh, productivity in the future, and optimize breeding cost. Metrics that I would use, KPIs. Uh, I like this too. I like reading efficiency, which assesses the reading process. And what this means is that uh, the way I calculate that is by expressing or knowing the proportion of heifers that are born alive. So those that are still born, I, I exclude. That actually calf at or below the target age. Okay, So that's going to give me an assessment of the efficiency, how my heifers are, are growing. My heifer effectiveness will combine my efficiency with the quality, okay? So in this case, I'm going to look at the proportion of heifers that are born alive at the target age, and my assessment of quality is they complete three lactations, okay? That's a measure of longevity, okay? If, if my heifer, if I done a good job with heifers, they will stay with me for a long time. Okay? That's, that's the concept. Very briefly, uh, we'll, we'll cover this uh, when I visit. Um, some KPIs or some things to look for, colostrum quality. This is a topic that has been extensively studied. I look at it in a different way. Uh, we've been looking at colostrum quality on terms of IgGs and serum proteins. And this is a study from the 80s, so I'm not showing you anything new. Uh, it's been with us for many years. Uh, what you see here is different protein levels in the dry cow, Russian. This is the amount of IgGs in the colostrum. It's not affected by the protein on the diet. However, when you look at the serum protein, so the amount of IgGs 
that actually go into the serum of the calf or, or that absorbed by the calf is actually affected by the way the dam was fed. And if the dam had low protein in the diet, despite the colostrum quality as we understand it today was good, the calves did not absorb the IgGs from that colostrum. Another study from the 90s shows the same thing, okay? Um, different colostrums from animals that were properly fed or, or are not properly fed. The guys that are born to animals that were restricted, they absorb less IgGs. So we have to start thinking on, on, on other values for colostrum quality. And we have been ignored the endocrine activity of colostrum. Colostrum is super rich in hormones and growth factors that are pivotal for fostering the development of the intestine and the absorption of nutrients and the absorption of IgGs. And these growth factors include insulin growth hormone, uh, epidermal growth factor, IgF1, IgF2, prolactin, many, many things. Um, just to throw some figures, eh? the colostrum quantity of insulin is 10 times greater okay, in, in colostrum than in milk. Or colostrum contains 10 times more cortisol than, than milk. So the reason why these things are so huge is because they have a huge function in fostering the development of the calves and, and setting the stage. There's other things in colostrum which are exosomes. Uh, these are vesicles that contain a small DNA fragments and small RNAs that also have a huge impact on the immune response. And, and I'll talk about this when I, when I visit you guys. Other KPIs. I like to know how much growth I'm getting in the first 60 days before winning. Why? For many reasons, but one of them is because it's positively correlated with milk production in the first lactation. And again, that's going to be correlated with longevity. Uh, I'm going to skip this in, in the interest of time. Um, after winning, it's actually more important. And that's something that has been not really... Be, it has not received enough attention in the industry. We've been focusing on the pre-winning phase. The post-winning phase, the immediate 60 days after winning, are very important. There is also, they are positively correlated with milk production in the future. And the slope that we see here is actually greater than the slope that we see in the first 60 days. Okay, it's a bit difficult to see here, but that's, that's where it is. Which means that the impact on milk production in the future is actually greater on what happens after winning than before winning, right? than in the first 60 days. And we'll talk about this in my visit, but this phase after winning is a golden opportunity for profit because these calves are super efficient. They are 35% efficient. So it's, it's a very good moment to, to foster growth. <coughs> Another KPI important for calves is when to win. And we've been told that we can win calves when they consume one kilo of starter feed. And yes, you can do that. But if you win them when they consume one kilo, they will grow about 900 grams per day. If you're happy with that, go ahead. I would like to see at least 1.2 kilos of growth after winning for the reasons that I expressed before, eh? because it's positively correlated with milk. So I will not win an animal until they consume two kilos of concentrate. How to achieve that and all this, we'll, we'll talk uh, over that in my visit. I will skip this and then just three more slides and then I'm done. Um, other KPIs, very important, they are health related. Um, this is the number of BRD, pneumonia cases, that a heifer has during the entire breeding process. And the bars depict the productive life. Huh? So I exclude dry periods. So if the heifers didn't have this data from 17,000 animals, those that never had a pneumonia case, they had an average productive life of 900 days, three lactations. One pneumonia, a little bit less. Two, less. Three, less. Four or more, even less. Now, there is a difference between these two these guys of more than 100 days, which is about 4,500 kilos or, or 4,000 kilos if you want of milk. So the real question is, if you're a dairy producer and you have a heifer that's eight months old and she has a fourth case of pneumonia, why do you want to keep investing on that animal if you know that on average you're going to have 4,000 less liters from that animal once you put it in your herd? And your herd has a space limitation. So your role as a producer and a consultant is to fill every space on the herd with the maximum productive animal that you can or the maximum longevity of the cows that you can. 
Okay, so selecting this animal as a cow will not be a good decision. The same thing with inseminations. There is a number of inseminations to achieve conception in the heifers. Those that get bred with two inseminations, they actually have 25%, one minus 75, less chances of finishing the first lactation than the animals that got bred once and became pregnant at the first insemination. So what you see again is that it goes down. And the message here is that if the heifers that are not pregnant after four inseminations, they are not worth to keep investing on them. These are heifers that will be really expensive. They will not be calving at 22 months. They will be probably calving at 27, 28. Lots of feet in their bellies, lots of pounds or euros. And chances are that that investment will never be recovered because they will not finish the first lactation. 50% chances, okay? So uh, it's not worth investment. They should go to the beef markets and, and move on. And the last one is that uh, heifers that abort, they have 2.73 greater odds of not finishing the first lactation. So again, uh, not worth to rebreed a heifer that has an abortion at, I don't know, 16 months of age or whatever. It's gonna, again, it's gonna calf very late. And once she calves, she's gonna leave the herd so fast that it's not gonna make for the investment. And that was a bit fast, perhaps at the end. Uh, that was all I want to convey to you. And I really look forward to seeing you in, in the UK when, when I come and we can discuss this further. Thank you for your attention. Lovely. Thank you very much, Alex. That's been uh, fascinating. And uh, we've covered a lot of ground in that um, in that hour. So, so thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to just change the sharing. Sorry, it's another bumpy one. Change the sharing across to, to my colleague, Tom. And right, perfect, excellent. Right, we've got some questions. We have had a few come through. Um, as we finished on the, the the calf side or the young stock side, I think we'll start there. Um, and you spoke about BRD, uh, bovine respiratory disease or pneumonia. Um, you've got one, two, three, and four cases. So what point does it become uneconomical to actually rear that calf? Are you saying that that's with four cases or at the first case, is that something that you, you'd want to take the first hit? Right, no, that's, that's good. Um, as, as many questions in biology, it depends. <laughs> it, it depends on when the fourth case appears, okay? Um, I would be inclined, the short answer would be four. So after four, I would just stop uh, breeding that animal. But of course, if the fourth occurs at 20 months of age, I probably go on and, and finish. But if the fourth occurs at uh, three months or four months of age, definitely I will call that animal. But fourth would be my, my, my limit. Four is the limit. No, I understand. No, I guess it, it raises questions then, I guess, about you know how many animals are in that boat and is it a one-off and what can you do in your management to, to minimize that so then we're looking at environment and, and colostrum and, and all of that so right uh, we'll, on the we'll cover that <laughs> yeah no so we'll cover that on the on the visit but I, I might just ask you the question about colostrum and, and maybe um the answer isn't ultimately clear we, we've got fairly rudimentary measures for colostrum. We, we put it on the ref, refractometer and we make, and like you say, we draw conclusions from that. But as you've described, it doesn't necessarily demonstrate the adsorption within the calf. So right. what would be a better measure? Yeah, I would actually look, instead of looking at colostrum, uh, I would actually look at the, absorption okay uh, so just get a blood sample of the animal and look at serum protein for instance um, of course that's after the fact and you want to and the answer and the question you're asking is should i use this colostrum or not my experience is that typically colostrum from heifers so from, from newly produced cows eh, from from first covers it's actually better fostering igg absorption than multiple cows Okay, 
Uh, reason being that it has double insulin levels, um, greater cortisol levels, it, it, it's loaded with hormones. So this, the ideal thing would be to measure hormones, but this is expensive. So I use proxies, and I, if I had to choose, I would choose colostrum from heifers. And, and definitely I would, I would look at blood of the animal instead of the colostrum. I see. I, I guess then you're into the trouble where, like you mentioned earlier on in your presentation, about looking at proxies that tell you something about the past that you then right. can't influence. Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. No, no, no. But, but that's why I'm looking at, at the end result. So because I cannot measure hormones because it's too expensive, what I'm going to look is on my calf. And I will I will learn from that. I have no option, right? Um, that's the only thing I can do. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. No, I understand. I understand. Well, we can have that discussion when you come over in, in a few weeks. So lovely. Um, another point you made, and sorry, we're still on colostrum. You said that the cows on a low protein diet tend to have um, their calves have a lower absorption of colostrum or IgGs. Yes. So at what stage um, pre-carving should that cow be supplemented right. or, or be supported with protein? Yeah, good, good question. Yeah, I was I didn't mention that the two studies that I showed, the one from the 81 and the one from the 90s, they had a restriction of uh, 60% that in the three weeks before calving, okay? The one in the 81 is 60% and then it goes up to, to 100%. So, uh, but it's three weeks before calving. Okay, okay, three weeks. No, that's uh, perfect. Excellent. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, a big question then, we'll go big. Um, what should our target be? Uh, for longevity for our industry? Uh, ideally, eh? I mean, the problem with longevity is that if you go too far, you're going to jeopardize genetic progress, okay? But we're at a level in genetics that we're quite good, okay? I, I don't think we're going to... We're actually at, at the limit, biological limit of... Uh, uh, thermodynamics so the animal is not able to to consume enough energy to sustain the amount of milk that they can produce genetically so in the future i mean if we look at in the back we've doubled milk production in dairy cows we're not going to double milk production of dairy cows in the next 20 years it's not going to happen okay it's going to increase a little bit more but not much so by that what i'm saying is that i'm concerned about genetic progress but not that much it's true, though, that now there will be new measures of genetic progress, not in terms of milk, but in terms of sustainability. There will be cows that are genetically superior in terms of carbon footprint than other cows. So we always have this need to improve our breed, okay, or, or the machine that we work with. Um, so if we increase longevity, we're going to jeopardize the improvement of, of or the quality of the animals that we deal with. Um, but having said so, my ideal, it would be if I could, I would go for a longevity of six, five minimum uh, lactations, provided that that longevity is proactive, okay? It's not as a consequence of, okay, I'm giving a second chance to a cow, okay? So I, I want six lactations that the cows, hey, they got no ketosis, no mastitis, they get bred at 80 days in milk, blah, 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 okay? If I'm starting to breed cows at... 200 days in milk, I have a problem. Yeah, yeah, no, I see, but I see. Five, six would be a very good target. It, it's a good balance between genetic progress and, 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 and of course, very, very sustainable uh, production because then the amount of heifers that you need is very low. The impact on the environment is very low. It would be ideal. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see, no, I, absolutely. And uh, we've we've heard before, I think from Rosie Lane and Gordy Jones, very, they were talking about efficiency of this fifth and sixth lactation cow, so um, so fully understand that. So, what is what's your experience with lung scanning and the benefits of use of, of this in long condition in the animal's future? Sorry, yeah. lung. lung scanning with ultrasound is is a lovely technique. Okay, it 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 requires a little bit of training, but once you train, it's actually not that difficult and not that slow. So you can really cover lots of animals in, in a relatively short amount of time. 
um, and it's very very informative. I since I'm doing that, I've been amazed, and and I'm I'm still amazed every time I do it that you see a calf that perfectly okay. She looks like happy jumping, and then she has the lungs are destroyed, and vice versa. You see animals that they have perfect lungs and they are with the ears drooping, and then they have another. It's, it's another thing. It's not a, a, a pneumonia. So it's very very informative. Uh, I really like it. Brilliant. Okay. Um, Lovely. To, Thank to you. be effective, uh, just a second. Sorry. Uh, to be effective is uh, it needs to be done sequentially, though. Okay. It, it's not good just to do one animal and that's it. You really have to follow the animal because you have to see the evolution to make a decision on whether you're going to treat or the animal is actually recovering from it, or you have to call the animal. I see. I see. Yeah. I, I imagine it's something that. Uh... It's a bit bit specialist, and it's uh, it's a difficult one to sort of do on the farm, you know, without. Uh, yeah, reason. but once you get trained, I mean, it's 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 relatively easy, and eh? it's not it's not complicated. It's much simpler than it looks. Yeah. No, I see. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. Um, well, on that uh, flat rate feeding, I mentioned Gordy Jones actually. Um, so uh, flat rate feeding. Have you got any views on flat rate? so flood rate feeding uh can you define that for me please oh so it's effectively the same ration fed to, to all cows with a okay. difference in all energy right. yeah yeah uh my <laughs> how to say that mm, this is a system that works in the us and it's widely used everywhere else because it comes from the us the US is a wealthy country with lots of resources and a huge economy of scale. Whenever they need more milk, they don't improve efficiency, they just put more cows. So they use one size fits all, and that works for them uh, in their situation. We have a different scenario. We are limited in, in, in land, we're limited in the number of cows that we can have. Um, if we need to improve our economy, we cannot rely on economy for scale. We cannot put more cows. So we really need to improve efficiency. And the only way to improve efficiency is making a t-shirt for every cow. So making groups. So I'm not I'm not really in favor, not not in favor at all of, of a flat rate feeding. Okay. No, that's, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. No, we, and I'm aware of herds that are, are using it. So uh, I thought it was definitely worth asking. Um, the, uh, I did have one then. It's just drifted from my mind then for a sec. Um, so you spoke a little bit about uh, net energy of lactation, uh, and is this something that NDF would be a, a, a good measure for? So, so not measure for, but by altering NDF, you could effectively um, refine uh, your net energy of lactation. I say this with very little knowledge on the subject, I have to say. Yeah, no, uh, that's net energy of lactation. So every ingredient or every ration has a given amount of energy, okay? So it's what we call gross energy. Then there is another fraction of that energy that will be excreted in feces. It's the one that is not digested, okay? So once you, once you remove the heat or the energy that's in the feces from the energy that was in the feed, you have the digestible energy then that digestible energy will be absorbed by the animal and will be metabolizable. A fraction of it will be lost uh, because it will not be metabolizable. It will be compounds that will not generate energy by the animal. So that's gonna be excreted in the urine. The rest, it's available energy. And that available energy will go either to maintenance, so keep the heart beating and the lungs working. That will be net energy for maintenance. And then there is another fraction of the energy that will go for milk. That will be net energy for lactation. And that's what I was referring in my slide. And this conversion of gross energy into net energy depends on the nutrients in the diet. So yes, if you increase NDF, so NDF, which is cellulose, and glucose, which is starch, they have the same gross energy. They have 4.8 megacals per kilo. They have the same. However, the net energy, the amount of energy that is in cellulose compared to starch, it's almost half, okay? In cellulose, there is half energy 
net energy than the starch because the animal is not able to digest it. All right. Um, so yeah. yes, if you, you, you can play with NDF. One, one, another thing is that, and that's a bit trickier, but uh, let's see if we can give it a shot. If I have a diet that, for instance, a straw has very little energy, okay? But if I have a cow that eats a lot and I add half a kilo of a straw, the end result may actually be that the cow at the end of the day consumes more energy or is able to extract more energy of the diet because by adding a straw to the diet or fiber, I'm reducing passage rate. So I'm giving a chance to the cow to extract more energy from the diet. So it's, right. it's a complicated matter, eh? but. <laughs> yeah, no, I see. I see. Yeah, you can get, you can gain that greater um, efficiency that way. Yeah, of, of course. Uh, yeah. So on, on that, we spoke, you mentioned straw. Um, how can we trust intake data from groups of cows? Uh, so how do you know that one particular group isn't dominating on intake? So for example, you, you often see it with dry cows. You've got far offs and close ups housed in the same place. You take an average intake and you assume that every cow in that pen is having that intake. So, so what, what can we do to get more refinement in those measures of intake? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. Um, my, I would follow up. I would follow up that with a question: Why you want to do that? Okay. Imagine that you can actually um, calculate or estimate individual intake of every cow in a group. You're still gonna feed them as a group. So even if you would know that, you cannot do anything with it. You're still gonna feed. 500 kilos of feed in that group. So sometimes we, we tend to, to try to estimate things uh, maybe far beyond that it's needed. Eh? So if I'm feeding a group of cows, I need to know the intake of the group of the cows. Um, it's not going to serve me to see uh, if the intake of if one cow is eating a bit more than the other. Having said that, I can use milk production as a proxy. And ideally, and that's the best thing, and I use I do that very quite often, is body weight. Body weight is a very good indication of feed intake as well. So if you have a cow that produces in a group of cows, one cow produces 10 liters and the other one produces 40, I can almost guarantee that the guy producing 40 is more than the guy that produces 10. But if I also look at body weight change. That's going to give me an indication of intake. Okay. If a cow today weighs 600 kilos and the next day she weighs 580, she stopped eating. She didn't lose 20 kilos in one day. It's just gut feel. So it's a very good uh, indication of, of intake. So these things that you have cows that are dominating or, or subordinate, once you move them in the close up pen, if you have body weight recording, uh, you can actually see this. Right. Okay. No, that's, that's great. No, that's, that's perfect. So it's so I guess in that in that analogy where you've got uh, a 90 litre cow, for example, should she exist? I know she exists in America, uh, and you and the rest of the cows are 40 litre cows. Obviously, her intake is going to be much greater and would, would push the average up. So right, could but, you? But again, that average is just it's just a number because you as a producer, what you're going to do is that that cow will be in a pen and the pen will consume. 1,000 kilos of feet every day. Uh, and your task is to make sure that you have 1,000 kilos of feet there. And if you're not overstocked, all the cows can eat as much as they want. So it's not going to be a problem. The problem of this is, so that's what I was saying at the beginning. Sometimes we put too much emphasis on estimating the intake of individual cows when we should be putting the, the emphasis on making sure that the cows can eat as much as they want. That means control the stocking density, uh, deliver the feed frequently, push up the feed so the cows have access to it. Those are the things that, are, that matter and you can control and actually take action. By knowing the individual intakes of cows, you can do little. You can, you still have to feed a kilo, a, a thousand kilos in that pen. Lovely. Excellent. So related to that, um, in parlor feeders, so parlor feeders, have you, have you got an opinion on feeding in parlor feeding? I love it. 
I really love it. I think it's a great opportunity to actually compensate for the things that we're debating now. Okay, so this cow that eats a little bit less or this cow that it produces a lot. So to me, there is flat rate feeding, as you said before. I don't like that. Uh, alternative to flat rate feeding, making groups or parallel feeding. And I much prefer parallel feeding than feed uh, in the pens with colors. Uh, some people do that. Uh, the advantage of feeding in the parlor is that all the cows are fed at the same time. The cow can anticipate at what time she's going to be fed, so she can make some room in, the, in her rumen and don't get stuffed with TMR because now she knows that in an hour she's going to get a woody. Whereas when you have it in the, in the middle of the pens, there is always transit and, and competition to access the, the feed delivery system. And one day the cow gets fed at 1 p.m. and the other one at 3, so they cannot accommodate the intake. So, yeah, I, I love the parlor feeding. And the beauty of the parlor feeding is that you can combine feeds. When you do that, then it's amazing. Because if you're feeding one single concentrate, um, it's one side feeds all. You can only play with quantity. But it doesn't matter the quantity if it is not properly balanced for the cow. But if you can combine one protein source and one energy source, now you can start delivering the nutrients that every cow needs. So it's, it's, it's quite nice. I like it a lot. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, well, that's perfect. Well, thank you so much, Alex. I think um, those last few slides, you just started to, to talk a little bit about what's happening sort of in the next, sort of between lactation one and lactation two. So as I understand it, there's a bit of a gap in, in the knowledge there. Um, I don't know if you've got a perspective on that. Yeah, there is there is a big gap and it's not a little. Um, we've been we've been doing research in calves, we've been doing research in heifers, um, but even research, once the heifer gets pregnant, between pregnancy and, and first calving, we know very little. We really know very little. And we don't know the consequences of that nine months may have on the longevity of the animal later on, on the other development, on, on the health of the calf that is born. So there are many unknowns that, that we still have. Uh, so there's plenty of opportunity to, to still improve the reproduction. Perfect. And some of these heifers, once they get into the first lactation, we have a huge failure rate. We have too many heifers that don't reach the second one. And I don't think that's because they're and properly fed that in the first lactation. I think the major source of the problem is before uh, they actually calf as they are heifers. Excellent, excellent. It leads me really nicely. Thank you, Alex, for that. Um, I, I wanted to just put a slide up for some of those meetings that we've got coming up where Alex is going to be joining us. We, we're starting in Preston in Lancashire on the Monday. Um, we're working down the country. Uh, sadly, we in just one week we couldn't get to the extremes of wales and scotland i'm afraid but um but this this webinar hopefully gets somewhere to to meeting that um after that um we've actually commissioned some work in collaboration with the university of reading james hanks dr, uh, dr. james hanks to start to look and shed some light on this this issue between first and second carving for a heifer uh, and there's some quite interesting findings from it. So um, we've got some meetings happening between the 21st and the 23rd of March, and then we've got some more in May. Uh, so uh, Jeannie Sherwin, Jenny Gibbons and Colin Mason are helping us um, to deliver those. Um, and then just uh, in terms of literature, uh, if Tom can flick me onto the next slide, just anybody who's registered for this of course you've got to be registered to be still watching now um we've we've got the calf management book uh that will have uh, citations from um, some of alex's work in the past in there um we've also got um, some past webinars uh, and you will be able to to watch this um uh, on repeat if there's any points you wanted to just revise uh but uh, bobby Hart, bobby hyde did one on his phd on practical calf housing you'll all get sent the links um you've also got uh Ginny sherwin's webinar there on um room and development that was just a few months ago and then uh gabby emery from butilar and jamie robertson uh talking about um developing calf rearing for the future 
so uh, it just remains really for me to, to thank Tom in the background for, for flicking on my slides, uh, to thank um, everybody for their attention and to thank our speaker this evening, um, Professor uh, Alex Back. Thank you so much. And we very much look forward to seeing you um, in a few weeks time. Yeah, see you all in a few weeks. Thanks for listening. Brilliant. Thank you. And everybody have a lovely evening. Good night. Good night.